How's everyone doing? All right. We got the clicker here. Let's see here. Is my message or PowerPoint on there? No? That's okay. There we go. All right. Good. And I can go back. All right. Got it. Cool. So I am uh, very grateful to be standing in front of all of you and very humbled and uh, blessed to be able to have the opportunity to spend the next 30 minutes with you guys. Um, and I just want to take a quick moment. I know Dave Bush already did this, but just acknowledge your guys' choice to obviously be here. There's a broad spectrum of uh, talent here. Some of you are relatively new, maybe started in the last year or two. Some of you have been around for 20 plus years and have sold millions of dollars worth of Cutco. And so, you know, it's just, I, I just want to acknowledge the fact that we have an opportunity in a group like this to be able to take some of the best performers, the best practices in different areas of the business and be able to come here and deliver like what's working for each and every person in the business and be able to give you guys like the their, like number one nuggets that have helped exponentially grow their business. And that's just really powerful. Like there's very few organizations and companies that create environments like this where you can grow at such a high level. And that's why you, when you hear those statistics, I mean, those are amazing statistics. The reason why is because of conferences like this and people being able to grow their personal business, you know, 25, 50, 100, 200% in a single year. And I think that's absolutely amazing. So, you know, this evening, I'm going to share with you a few things. And um, really, it's going to be what I have, what I feel like has helped me grow my business, specifically in the last three years, going from 400 to 688 to 769 or so, and um, you know, continually growing through that. And for those of you that were at Net last year, um, I had a, you could say, like an abnormal approach to maybe what is normally spoken at uh, conferences. It wasn't much script as much as it was the psychology of thinking and how to work with customers. And I'm going to kind of continue with that thread because that's something that's really passionate to me and something that I believe is the biggest area of growth and opportunity for individuals in the Cutco realm. Um, and I'm going to be asking a lot of questions uh, throughout my message. And these questions are going to be rhetorical questions, but I encourage you to write them down and spend some time reflecting on it. And it's going to help create some self-awareness of your own business and your own practices of where you can improve the most and, you know, uh, encourage some more critical think thinking because that's what I've done in my business and it's had a huge impact for me. So uh, with that said, I just want to go ahead and get started and give you guys a few um, outcomes for uh, this message. The first one is going to be to learn how to be more intentional with what you say, right? So that's number one is to be more intentional with what you say. Number two, how to extract the most out of every opportunity by a shift in your mindset and skill set. And number three is to learn the power of questions and how to close through thoughtful questioning. And for those of you that know me well enough know that I love asking questions. Um, it's just something I, you just can learn a lot about a person and a lot about a situation by the questions you ask. And so that just in general, uh, t t just to uh, get something to take away from this message is just ask more questions. You'll probably sell more Cutco. So um, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and uh, dive in here. And we got this famous, uh, uh, I guess, image that you've probably seen on Facebook and social media, if you guys have either of those. Um, and, and word execution, this is point number one, is word execution. And before I go, get into the analogy of this, I just want to, I'll let you guys kind of look at it because you're going to figure out where's the coffee going to go first, right? Which cup? And um, really quick, give you guys a few seconds. Raise of hands. I just want to see people's observation. Who, raise your hands really quick. Um, who thinks it's going to go into cup number four? All right, portion of the room. Who thinks it's going to go into cup number nine first? Nine? All right, who thinks it's going to go into cup number five? All right, larger portion of the room. And who thinks it's going to go into cup number seven? Nobody, two people. All right, so if you look closer, everyone's talking, you'll see that there's blocks in the funnel system, right? And so it's not going to go into cup number four, obviously, because it's barricaded right there. It's not going to go into cup number nine because it won't even get to the cup. 
and same with seven, which forces all the coffee to go where? Five, all right? So I would say about 30% of the room got this right, which is great. Progress. Uh, <laughs> so why do I have this up here? And what does this have anything to do with selling Cutco? Well, see, those coffee cups, four, nine, five, and seven, those represent different objections that customers have, right? And the coffee itself is you as the representative and the words that you're say saying and sharing with your customers, all right, as you're trying to handle an objection, all right? And what's interesting, and I think one of the biggest areas of opportunity for us as a collective group is to be more aware of like what customers' objections are in the first place. And I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this where you're trying to, you know, let's say cup number four is I need to think about it. And you're like, all right, well, I'm going to try to handle that objection, right? But in reality, their real objection is cup number five, which is they think it's too many knives or they're not sure if they're going to use all the knives, right? But you're over here trying to solve objection number four because they said they want to think about it, not realizing that that's not the true objection to begin with. And so, obviously, if you keep working at it, right, if you're like, I'm going to fill up cup number four, I'm going to get there, I'm going to get there, at some point, you're going to realize the coffee's going somewhere else. It's going into cup number five, and you'll explore what that objection is and finally solve it, hopefully. Um, but if not, the whole point is, what if you could just have a more specific focus with the words that you're saying to be able to directly solve the customer's objection, the customer's problem that they have, and solve it as quickly and as effectively as possible, right? That, at, at the end of the day, that's what you want to do, is you want to get from point A to point Z as quickly as possible, especially in a fair and show setting, and problem solve as quickly as possible, all right? This is one of the, I, I believe, one of the biggest mistakes reps make, because then you're trying to close a customer, and you're waiting to, and you know, you can't figure out what the issue is and you're not able to close them and then they start like losing, like paying attention to you. They're not like really listening. And then someone else walks up and it's a walk up ultimate. And you're like, man, if I could have just like never talked to that person to begin with or problem solved quicker, quicker, you'd have been able to have that walk up ultimate. And so at the end of the day, what we wanna do is be as efficient as possible with our interactions with our customers so that we can directly, you know, impact our results and our sales. Right, And so what is that going to take? Well, it's going to require a high level of presence. It's going to require a high level of focus and intention. Right, And this is a perfect example. You, you look at it briefly and you're like, oh, it's cup number four. Oh, it's cup number nine. But if you use a little bit of focus, a little bit of presence, right, intention, you'll be able to see that it's obviously going to cup number five. So... You know, first question to ask you guys, and you can write this down, is just really more of a self-reflection, but, you know, are you constantly keeping yourself in check from not being a robot, right? We all have scripts that have been created from some of the greats in the Cutco industry, but how often are you just going through the motions? A lot of you guys work a lot of shows, and that's great, and a lot of your business comes from shows, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's easy to get into a point of where you're just like, going through the motions, but this customer's walking up and seeing it for the first time. Like, how can you be more authentic? It, you know, I, I listen to other people like give pitches and it's just very scripted. And the customer not, might not be able to acknowledge that, right? They don't know what's happening, but they'll start to disconnect because you're not really connected in the first place, right? And that's something I'm always keeping myself in check and doing. So, you know, let's get into this a little further. You know, why do you say what you say? Right? Have you ever gone through your script and asked yourself, why am I even saying this in the first place? And I guarantee you, the highest performers in this room have a purpose and intention behind everything that they say. So that's, you know, point number one right there, is what's the purpose behind your question or statement? Or do you even have one? Or are you just saying it because it's in the script and it sounds good? Right? So it could be something as simple as how long ago did you buy your set of Cutco? Right? So simple question, everybody asks. But if I were to ask you right now, why do you even ask that? 
What's the purpose behind, hey, how long have you had your set of Cutco? Well, for me, my reason for asking is because I want to know, right, when the last time they bought Cutco, and mostly because I want to know what the price they paid, right? Was it five years ago, 10 years ago? How familiar are they with the price of Cutco? And do I need to build value? So a simple question like that, you can learn a lot about a customer. Or did they buy a whole set of Cutco or pieces? Are they used to, have they been trained by new reps or seasoned reps of always buying buy three, get one free, buy five, get one three, you know, get one free, buy two, get one free. Are they used to buying pieces or are they used to buying larger orders, right? Because we all know, you know, you all know different representatives within your division that are known for like different things, right? And there's nothing wrong with that, but being aware of it and you wanna have customers, you wanna, do I need to, this customer walks up, and do I need to retrain them, right? Do I need to retrain them on how to buy Cutco? Oh yeah, we have like that set right there. It's, you know, the galley set. And we bought it over like 10 years. So they're used to buying pieces. So now it's a completely different approach of how I'm gonna engage this customer because I need to build value and have them understand why there's more value in buying a bulk set or an entire upgrade versus pieces, right? Simple questions like that. What's the intention behind it? When you're going through names and uses, a lot of you guys probably speed through it and there's nothing wrong with speeding through it. I go through it pretty quickly. It saves a lot of time. But how many times are you talking about a specific knife, like the spatula? It's like, oh, do you ever cut, up, cut open avocados? And you see their eyes light up, right? And they're like, oh, I get it. Like, I understand what that knife's for. But then you, you proceed to talk for another two minutes about the spatula spreader, right? Why? They're already sold on the spatula spreader by avocados alone or whatever the trigger word is for the customer. Move on to the next thing, right? It's about efficiency. How quickly can you get in and get out, build value, and have the customer feeling comfortable and confident about their purchase? If they're excited about the spatula because they do avocados all the time, you don't need to talk about bagels and baking and making sandwiches and all these other things, right? So if there's no purpose behind it, the, the moral of the story is to get rid of it in the script, right? And this is some, I mean, this should be an assignment for you guys, right? It might take you several days, but I can guarantee you the impact it'll make on your business will be huge, all right? Number two uh, within this is how do you want the customer to feel when you make a certain statement, right? Good rhetorical question. How do you want the customer to actually feel? Do you think about the emotions and the, the roller coaster ride essentially you want the customer to go through? So like one phrase that I use that some of you may use also and I think it's great. Um, I'm not sure if I learned this from someone else or I created it, but imagine how much more enjoyable the cooking experience will be having the right tool for the right job, right? That's been spoken at several conferences. If you haven't heard it, it's a great line to use. Imagine how much more enjoyable the cooking experience will be having the right tool for the right job. But then the question is, when do you use this phrase? Well, for me, I use it right when I'm telling them the price of Cutco, right? Because now that they're aware of the price or I'm giving them a ballpark of what Cutco could potentially cost or a price comparison, whatever you guys do in your pitch, you know, you're like, yeah, you know, Cutco, can go for $100 to $200 a knife. Some of our sets are several thousands of dollars, right? But imagine how much in more enjoyable the cooking experience is going to be having the right tool for the right job. So you keep them in the bumper lanes of like what you want them to be thinking about consistently, right? You want to guide their thinking. You know, and then piggyback off that. What's the ideal emotion a customer should feel at this point and how do I create it? So for those of you that were here last year, I talked about leather cutting, something as simple as leather cutting, but I got a lot of good feedback from it of how to cut leather properly. But one thing I'll say is after I'm done cutting leather is I'll always ask them, you know, the, you know they'll do the junk knife and then they'll do the Cutco knife and they're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing, right? What kind of knives do you have at home? Right? I specifically ask a very elementary question that I'm sure all of you ask, but it's about when you ask it. Right? I ask that as soon as they cut the leather with the Cutco knife. B 
because now they just cut with something that like blew their mind, they're absolutely amazed by it, and now they have to think back to what they have at home, which is something not as good, right? And so it's like a dip into the past, it's like, oh, this is what I have at home, but I really like this a lot more, right? It's, very, it's the small things, right, that make a larger impact in the end of the, the pitch. So I'm strategically asking questions and making statements at specific times. So really the overall gist is having your finger on the pulse of where the customer is at any given point. The power of asking these questions to yourself about your script and to customers helps you cut out the excess and deliver powerful statements to your customers consistently. So before I transition to the next uh, point, just one last question I want to ask you guys is, do your words have purpose and intention when you're engaged with customers? And imagine the lift, right? Imagine the lift your year would have if your entire conversation with every customer was authentic. It wasn't scripted. It was specific. It was tailored. It was personal, right? It was intentional. I'm very confident that the results we would see just from that alone would be huge. I gotta slide down here. Just figured that out. All right. Point number two, maximize opportunity. So when I look back at 2017 and 2016, and really maximizing the opportunity is critical to one's success, you know? There's only going to be so many people who walk in the door of a specific, like, venue, a show, a gun show, whatever it might be, right? So you got X amount of people. That animated picture is all the people that are walking through the door, of the door right? And of those people, only a certain percentage of those people are actually going to walk by your booth, right? And of those people that even walk by your booth, there's only going to be a, a smaller percentage of those who actually see the Cutco booth, right? A lot of times they're looking across the way and they never even see you, right? And of the people that even see your booth, there's only going to be a certain amount of those who are actually qualified, right? And of those, there's only going to be a smaller percentage of people who have any type of remote interest in knives, right, or, or in the market for knives, right? So now you're working with a very finite amount of individuals, right? and of people that you actually talk to, right? Those are all the potential happy Cutco customers, right? So, so you figure you're going to get about 5 to 30, 40, you know, depending on the event, maybe more, interactions with customers each day, right? That's all you're going to get. And this very simple realization, but just acknowledging and being aware of the fact that, hey, I, I'm only going to be able to talk to so many people today, so what am I going to do to maximize that opportunity, right? Because it doesn't matter if you're, you know, a new rep or you're Jason Jeffrey, you know, or whatever event you're working, you're only going to have so many people that walk by you and are qualified, right? So what are you going to do in those interactions? Who are you going to choose to talk to and how are you going to maximize the interaction with the customer? And obviously, what I've shared from point number one will dramatically help, right? But you want to make sure that you are maximizing every opportunity. So <clears throat> here's another question for you guys. Are you respecting each customer's interaction at the level you should? You know, how much differently would you actually show up if I told you at the start of the day that there's going to be someone that you'll speak to and they're going to buy $10,000 from you if you respect the interaction, right? Because it's very easy in fair and show setting when you're working 10, 15 plus hours a day, especially during kiosks, right? You know, long year trying to hit a goal and you're tired and you're f fatigued, right? Are you respecting each interaction at the level that you could? And if you did, what would actually come of that, right? I think back to you know this past year, and um, Mike Dowd had like an 18k day at his big show. Props to you, that was awesome. And I was like, well, I can have an 18k day, and I'll, I'm like, I need to figure out how to have that, 
all right? This was like a simple mental shift I had, like how can I maximize each and every situation with every customer? So a couple months later, I was able to have an 18K day, and then two months after that, I was able to have a 19K day, and I, I truly believe that a big reason for that was because of respecting each and every customer and never settling, right? Dave Bush said that's something that I'm really good at. I never settle. It doesn't matter how big of a day you're having, like how can you continually up-level each and every single day? So, you know, using different situations, but if I were to say, you know, you're guaranteed to hit your goal for the year, for 2018, if you could just close 10 people today at the booth, right? Or you're guaranteed to hit your goal today or for the year if you didn't let one person walk, right? What if that was your focus? I'm gonna close 10 people today, right? You don't really have that much control over how many people are gonna walk by your booth, as I mentioned earlier, but you do have control over not letting one person walk and developing the skill sets to do that. That was a shift I had. I was not gonna let one person walk unless I knew for 100% certainty that they weren't gonna buy no matter what. So what would you say differently? How would you show up differently? So a few tools that I've used um, for myself that has really helped in maximizing the opportunity. Some of you guys already probably do some of these things. But when it comes to the booth, I keep like the homemaker in the far back. And everyone has different strategies, right? So figure out what works for you. This might not work for you and that's okay. But I only have like the ultimate and the signature like next to me. And I'm sure a lot of you already do that. But if you wanna sell more ultimates, if you wanna sell more you know, family sets, have those near you because that's where their attention is gonna be focused, right? Another thing, maximizing opportunity. I know there's a whole message on upserving, but instead of what has been taught most of the time, which is, hey, because of what you're getting, you unlock these secret specials, and I think that's great, and obviously we all upserve more because of those lines. What if you just found something else that the customer was interested, and you said, hey, you should just add that on? Like, have you ever thought about just like adding more to the order just because? Like, I can't tell you how many times I have a customer who's buying a, you know, let's say a homemaker set, and they're like, I really like the hearty slicer. I'm like, great, tell them about it, build value. Okay, awesome, well that's only gonna be about 30 bucks more a month, right? You might as well do it. If you're gonna get it eventually, you might as well get it now, right? You'll, if, if you ever field train with me, you'll hear me say that all the time. If you're gonna get it eventually, you might as well just do it now. If it fits into the budget and it's not gonna break the bank, doesn't it make sense just to get it now? Right? And so there's nothing wrong with a buy two, buy three, buy four, get one free. But every time you give something free, that's taking away income from your pocket and CPO, right? And who's to say that you can't upserve without giving something for free? Customers getting you know, a family set, maybe you're already giving them a discount. You hear the wife say, oh, I would love to have those, right? The kitchen tools, right? You build value, you tell them the price, retail, like pieced out, and then you give them the price of what it is, you know, packaged together. Hey, it's only gonna be 50 bucks more a month, 60 bucks more a month. If you think you're gonna get it eventually, you might as well get it now, all right? A lot of my upserving has been from just not, because here's what this does. After you upserve 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 1,000 dollars without giving anything extra for free, then you have another layer of upserving where you can say, hey, because of what you're already getting, we have some secret specials, however you want to phrase it, right? And then you can start giving extra things for free so the perceived value is even higher, right? And so there's more stages to the process. Another thing I'll do to maximize the opportunity is when it comes to the ultimate, I'll have a phrase, and instead of you guys trying to like just write this down, just listen to it, get the general gist, I think that's more important, is, hey, Mrs. Jones, so this is our complete set. This is the set everybody wants. It's not the set that necessarily everybody can afford but it's definitely the set that everybody works towards. And there's two different types of people who get this set. 
There's the people who get it who just want the biggest and the best of everything, right? And you'll see, sometimes see the customer nod, like, oh, that's me. Or there's the customer who just wants to have the right tool for the right job. And so they'll get the complete set, right? And so what I tell most people to do is if you can't afford it and you think you're going to get the set eventually anyways, you might as well just get it now, right? Yes. So, and by the way, I'm going to explain a little bit of the psychology behind it. But So this is the set everybody wants. Everybody wants what everybody else has, right? Deep down, sublim you know, psychologically, that's what people want, right? So this is the set everybody wants. It's not the set everyone can afford, but it's the set that people work towards, right? So that's a challenge, especially to men who are like, oh, I just want it. I can afford it, right? It's not the set everyone can afford, right? But it's a set everybody works towards. So now you're starting to, like, call them out very, like, subtly, right? So it, it triggers certain people throughout this whole phrasing. But it's the set everybody is gonna, works towards eventually. So even if they don't get it, you're planting the seed that at some point down the road, they're going to end up having the complete set. So they can start with the galley. That's fine. You're going to work your way up towards it, right? Lifetime value of a customer. And there's two different types of people, Mrs. Jones. There's the people who, who get it because they want the biggest and the best of everything. And that's a large proportion of people in general. So you're going to speak to that demographic, right? And then there's the people who just appreciate quality and want to have the right tool for the right job when they're cooking. Right? So you hit both, both types of customers. So what I tell most people is if you can't afford it, and you think you might work your way up to it eventually anyways, you might as well get it now. And this is, by the way, before I've even shown the price of Cutco uh, or like the price of the set. This is, I'm just showing the different options, but this is just like setting the right expectations and building a foundation for them to have interest. Cause then you'll get to like asking, I do an option close, like which set do you want? Like, well, obviously I'm gonna want the biggest set. Obviously, right? Of course. And then that gives you a place to work from. All right, and then one other thing I wanna touch on before I go into my last point is Upgrades. So a lot of different strategies in the room when it comes to upgrades. And again, there's not one way that's the right way. It's what works for you and your personality, right? But this is a great way to maximize your opportunity. So upgrade, when I, so when I upgrade, let's say a customer has a paring knife, trimmer, spatula, and a Santoku. Five inch, seven inch, doesn't matter, right? And they just got pieces from maybe a new rep. Right? If I'm upgrading them to a homemaker, I, a lot of people are going to customize the upgrade first and foremost, which I don't think is the best strategy, right? Because it kind of handicaps you for down the road if you want to ever upgrade them again. Well, I got all the best pieces in my homemaker. Why would I need a signature or a, a complete set, right? So the first thing is try not to customize. That's like a drop down option, right? My, my belief system. Secondly, a lot of times, if people have those four pieces that I just mentioned, let's say, and then you try to upgrade, automatically customers are going to be like, well, you have the Santoku, and that's the same thing as the chef knife, so we can just take the chef knife out and put the Santoku in, right? And I used to do that. And again, nothing wrong with that. But a lot of times, people, I mean, most people cut vegetables more than anything else in their kitchen, right? And so because of that, it doesn't hurt to have two vegetable knives, right? And so what if you upgraded with the pieces that are actually supposed to be in the, the set to begin with, right? So when I upgrade, I'm going to upgrade with a chef knife, and I'm not going to take the butcher knife out, or I'm not, yeah, I'm not going to take the butcher knife out to put the Santoku in. I'm going to leave the butcher knife in. And I'll tell them, I'm like, hey, this is what comes in your upgrade. This is everything you're missing. This is what would complete your basic set. And even if they asked, well, would everything fit? I'll be fully transparent. No, the Santoku won't fit because it's not designed to come in this set, but that's okay because we have this custom sheath that comes with your upgrade, right? So you can store it in the drawer and it's great. So when you go to a customer's house and you know they have really bad knives, you can just take yours and you'll have you know, a good knife to work with, 
right? You can think of something. But the point is, is you're gonna add more CPO that way by upgrading with the pieces that you're supposed to. And then if they say no, for whatever reason, it's a lot easier to drop down and say, well, you know what we can do? Huh, just thinking about this now, you already have the Santoku, and that's really good for vegetables, so what we can, do, you know, you sell them off what you just sold them on. Don't laugh, you guys all do it. <laughs> but here's the other thing, not only is this gonna add more value to each order, but, and it gives you more uh, positioning to drop down, but it also helps you in upserving. So when the customer now says yes to the basic set, yes to the sheath with the seven inch Santoku, you can say, hey, by the way, like, you know, I'm just thinking about this now, based on what you already have, I know you'd probably get the cheese knife down the road, right? Oh yeah, I love that one. I just, you know, tie it on money right now. Totally understand. If you're gonna get the cheese knife eventually or the nonstick knife and the barbecue knife eventually, we have a set that actually comes with those pieces and there's a slot for the seven inch Santoku or the five inch Santoku, so it'll fit everything all together. And that way you don't have to worry about getting a bigger block. So if it's something you think you might do eventually down the road, it would probably make more sense just to do it now. Do you want me to just show you what that would be? Right? And it's an easier transition into upgrading to the next size setup because they already have a piece that doesn't fit in the block and everyone wants it to be complete. All right, transitioning to the last point. We've got about six minutes. All right, blueprint questioning. So we got a maze there. And this is an analogy or an example of you being right there at the beginning of the maze and the customer's credit card is in the middle. All right, and your goal and objective is obviously to get to the center. Now, in this scenario, it's gonna be, it, it'll probably take you a while. Clearly the walls are much taller, right? Let's just pretend you can't climb on the walls and you have to go through and you're just gonna basically be guessing if you were there and you didn't have a map, right? And what's interesting is, you know, a lot of times reps do this. They'll just kind of like feel it out. Like, I think I'm going in the right direction. Right? And obviously the objective is not to do that. So how does one get, you know, to a customer's credit card, let's say? Right? Or how does one get to the point where the customer is ready to purchase? Well, there are a few things need to happen. One, pain. Right? Customer needs to feel pain or a feel a need with what the customer already has at home. Right? There has to be some type of urgency there. There has to be a reason to make the purchase. Right? There's got to be value. There's got to be connection with the customer. So these are all things that need to play a, a role and play a part throughout the entire pitch. So asking the right questions obviously gives you direction in wh which areas to focus on. So one question I'll ask if you're not sure, like if it's hard for you to get a read on the customer, one question I'll ask is, hey, I'm curious, and this is more like in the beginning if you need to like qualify them and kind of like feel the water out. Hey, I'm curious if you, it, you know, Andy, if you saw the value in Cutco today and you could get use out of everything in the set and it fit in the budget, would this be something you'd consider today, right? And so it's basically a quick like pre-qualification, like, hey, I'm just curious, like if you saw the value in Cutco, you'd use it and it would fit into the budget, right? Is this something you might consider today? Or is this something you'd consider doing without your wife? Especially if they're like, yeah, I'm not gonna make any decisions without my wife. It's a good question to ask, All right? So that really quickly, you know, should I keep going, especially if it's busy, or should I move on to someone else? All right, I'm running out of time here, so we're gonna go quick. So obviously when you have a map like this, it's a lot easier to navigate through the customer, right? And so that's the whole concept of like blueprint questioning. The more questions you ask, the more you can learn about a customer and the quicker you can get to the center. Now really quick, we're gonna do this really fast. If you had to go through this maze and you wanted to see which maze you could get to the center the quickest, raise your hand if you'd rather have the, ma the maze on the left, raise your hand. All right, what about the right? 
Awesome. All right. See, you guys are paying more attention, right? You're more in tune, more presence, okay? For those of you that said the one on the left, you can't get to the center. It's physically impossible, but how many times do we go through an entire pitch and you realize you could never close the customer to begin with, right? So the focus is to get to the center. So I would rather work with a customer for 45 minutes to but finally close them than someone who's like, oh, I've been wanting to buy these knives forever, and you don't qualify them, you cut corners, and you realize that they were never going to buy anyways. Oh, I'm not going to get it today, right? Or you leave the customer you were just talking to because you hear someone else on the side say, oh, yeah, we need to buy a set for my son. Oh, not today, right? And you drop the first customer and you realize you just lost both of them, right? We've all been there. So, all right, so with that said, I'm going to wrap up here because I got like a minute. People get caught up in the close and they get caught up in the objection. And really, I want you guys to just focus on when you get to that part where you're trying to wrap up the you know, order and you're trying to you know, close, how can I move the needle? How can I consistently move the needle? Representatives get really nervous and they're not sure what to say, so they start building rapport and talking about football and random stuff. It's like, you're not there to like have a whole lifelong conversation, right, at the booth. I mean, maybe you are, but you want to make the most use of your time. So I have a few questions that I ask at the end of the demo when they're giving me objections that I use. Some of you have heard these before, but it'll be a good reminder. And I'm just going to go through these quickly. You, a lot of you know I love scaling questions. So hey, on a scale of 1 to 10, how likely is it that you'll get cut code today? If you have no clue where, you're, where they're at or you think they're at one point, just ask them. You might think they're at a 5 and they're at a 7 or vice versa. And let's say they say they're at a 7. Well, the follow-up question is, what would it take to get you to a 9? Not a 10, because they don't, you don't want them to feel committed. Get them to a 9. Just get them over the hump. Right? And they're going to give you a solution to that. Another question I ask, just super direct, right? Straight to the point. What's the biggest thing holding you back from getting Cutco? What's the biggest thing? And your job is obviously to be solution oriented and find the, the solution to that. All right, another thing I'll ask. Cus customers about to walk away, you feel like you're losing traction with them, they're like three feet away. Hey, really quick, you know, before you head out, can I just ask you a few questions to make sure we're on the same page? All right? Hey, really quick, before you head out, can I just ask you a few questions to make sure we're on the same page? Is it safe to say that you'll end up getting Cutco eventually? Yes. And you do see the quality and the value of Cutco, right? Of course, yeah, it's great. And would you agree this is the right set, the, set, the family set right here, this is the right set that for you and for your family? Yeah, absolutely. And I gotta know, if you really, really wanted to, could you fit 300 bucks into the budget right now? If you really wanted to, I mean, I could if I really wanted to, great. So what I'm hearing you saying, Josh, is that you're going to get Cutco eventually, and you see the quality and the value of it, and this is the right set for you, and you could afford it, right? And I've already shared with you earlier that this is the best time to buy Cutco because of the promotions that we have. Wouldn't it make more sense just to get it now? Right? So you're using tie-down questions and asking them the right things to basically close the order, right? I'm running out of time. I'm going to leave you with one last thing. If they're like, well, I really got to talk to my wife. Here's the last sentence you want to you wanna use, right? Mike, if there was a solution that involved you getting that set today and not talking to your wife, what would that look like? If there was a solution that involved you getting that set today and not thinking about it, what would that look like? That's what I got. Thanks, guys.